High above the coast of Maine, a single prop Cessna is headed 23 miles out to sea. It's bound for Matinicus, the most remote inhabited island on the Atlantic seaboard. Amazon has extended its reach so completely into the fabric of American life, it's even made it here. Beyond that island, the nearest land is Portugal. Yes, it is remote. That's why we like it. George and Robin Tarkelson are among the 20 or so hardy souls who call this frigid rock home. Matinicus is a throwback to the American frontier, minus the general store. So to keep them connected to civilization, the Tarkelsons get as many as three Amazon deliveries a week. The printer came from Amazon, computer speakers here and here, yoga mat, this Kindle, the radio, a lot of the CDs, TV came from Amazon, the backrest came from Amazon. Amazon is everywhere, even in the middle of nowhere. Well, we're completely off the grid. We don't have any lines coming down to our house. We generate all our own power. It's roughing it, except for this cable snaking into the woods, their lifeline to Amazon. There's almost nothing the Tarkelsons need that Amazon can't send them. You know, there's got to be a catch. There's no way that a washing machine is going to make it out here. And he ordered it, and he said, no, it's going to be coming. It came two days later. They may be off the grid, but the Tarkelsons are right in step with the rest of us. Amazon has more than 240 million customers. Here in the U.S., that's six of every ten adults who use the Internet. Today, the Amazon empire is at the very heart of the economy. A retail megastore, bookseller, entertainment studio, music service, and grocery store on track to bring in $90 billion a year in revenue. And it's all the creation of this man, Jeff Bezos a driven, hyper-rational entrepreneur who has staked a claim on almost everything we buy. Welcome. <laughs> His most recent venture? I can't wait for you to get your own hands on it and look at it. An Amazon smartphone. Just the latest gambit from someone who has defied expectations from the very beginning. It was 1994. No broadband. No Wi-Fi, just a new thing called the Internet. I found this fact on a website that the web was growing at 2,300% a year. At 30, Bezos was working for a New York hedge fund that was looking for commercial opportunities. The idea that sort of entranced me was this idea of building a bookstore online. Americans were spending $19 billion a year on books. His store would not be limited by shelf space. It was very clear to me when I thought about it that way that starting this, this company to sell books on the web, if I didn't try it, I knew I would always regret that. He was very explicit from the beginning that he thought there was an e-commerce gold rush going on. Bezos hired James Marcus to write book reviews in 1996. He constantly would say that brands are like quick-drying cement and that Amazon could not be permanently identified as a bookstore only. So that just led to this kind of frantic rush into every conceivable area of e-commerce. Amazon went public in 1997. By 2001, the dot-com bust had claimed its victims. Bezos emerged a survivor, thanks to layoffs, cost-cutting, and a single mantra he's repeated for years. I believe that if you can focus obsessively enough on customer experience, focused on the customer experience, making sure we do a great job for customers. We try to make the best service we can, something that we hope customers will love, and then customers choose. Today, Amazon sales are well below Walmart's, but it sells more stuff online than its 12 closest competitors combined, including some items brick and mortar stores would never sell, from sex toys to swastikas, all found in those miles of shelves alongside TVs and tires. <laughs> for photographer Seth Heinrichs, it's perfect. He pays $99 a year for a program called Prime, 
two day shipping and a basket of perks. There have been moments where the prime shipping has really saved my rear end because I have a shoot coming up and I need this piece or, you know, whatever. Besides earning the company two and a half billion dollars a year in fees, Prime has gathered more than 25 million members. On average, after they join, those Amazon addicts double their spending on the site. It almost is a stream of consciousness. Uh, as I'm thinking about something that I know I need or that I know I want, um, it's something that I'll either quick do a price check on on my phone or make sure that uh, it's available through Amazon. That convenience is not just by design, but a cunning strategy. What's your sense of Prime as a, as a tool and what it's meant to Amazon? You're charging consumers to participate in your loyalty program so you can sell more to them? That is amazing. David Selinger is a former Amazon manager who was hired to maximize profits by dissecting customer behavior. He explained to us that nothing on the Amazon website is left to chance. And every single thing that happens here is a result of data. Absolutely. Maximizing the profit for every single pixel on the Amazon website. Does Amazon measure how long I'm on a site? whether I click off and whether it matters in terms of how quickly a page comes up? Absolutely. So when I was at Amazon, we looked at millions of different sessions, millions and millions of different consumers. And when they were shopping, if the website was one-tenth of a second slower, we lost 1% of the revenue. 1% of the revenue. Even taking a tenth of a second longer to render the page could cost Amazon as much as 1% of their total sales. And so we analyzed that very, very deeply. If you have to click multiple buttons, if you have to wait for too long, if you have to enter a lot of information, all of those things create friction. And uh, friction exponentially kills the joy of shopping. Nadia Shorabora was a member of Jeff Bezos's S team, the inner circle of executives who run the company. A Russian-born mathematician, Shorabora is the mastermind behind Amazon's computer brain. It's about customer convenience, and convenience comes from selection. And if we guarantee a selection, we simply guarantee that customers will not search for items anywhere else. Trigger fingers like Heinrichs now shop at the speed of thought. He uses one click, the ability to bypass the shopping cart and buy in an instant. Another Bezos masterstroke. You got to be careful with one click. One click can get you into a lot of trouble. If you're not doing the math in your head, it's just too easy to be impulsive with my purchases. It's instant gratification, even miles from anywhere. The one click shopping, that's dangerous. I have to always take my hands away and say, okay, think about it for 10 seconds. Don't hit the button, just think about it. Is it a want or a need? Um, pasta, comfort food, and Cheerios. Coming up, face to face with the smartest guy in the room. So Jeff's initial wording, I believe if I remember correctly, was that it was one of the stupidest ideas he'd ever heard. Leading by confrontation when we return. ambitious companies in the world is a man who is at once famous yeah, baby. but not well known. <laughs> Amazon founder Jeff Bezos can seem more like the guy next door yeah, you got it. than one of the wealthiest men in the world. <laughs> There's the casual demeanor, the goofy personality, come in, come in. and that laugh <laughs> that even he admits is unmistakable. I can't help but laugh. There was a time when uh, my brother and sister would not go see a movie with me. It was too embarrassing. So I'm long used to this kind of abuse. <laughs> hey, Carl. Good. How's it going? Excellent. But don't be fooled. Beneath the disarming yeah. exterior is one of the most cerebral, determined, and calculating business leaders ever. Bezos is a uniquely driven individual who's changed the world, and we need to know where he came from and what makes him tick. Author Brad Stone spent years studying Bezos for his book, The Everything Store. What's he like in the workplace? Well, first I'll say that uh, public Jeff Bezos is a lot different than the Bezos that the world doesn't see. And of course, that's not surprising. But, you know, Jeff talking to the press or speaking in public is, as with all things, very strategic. 
We wanted to speak with Jeff Bezos for this documentary, but both he and Amazon declined any participation in our story. In some cases, Amazon also instructed its business associates not to speak with us. But many former company executives did talk. It's those conversations, as well as past interviews with Bezos, that helped paint the picture. Do you recall your first conversation <clears throat> with Bezos? I very markedly remember my first conversation with Jeff Bezos. Uh, this, there are very few people that have met Jeff that don't remember their first conversation with him. David Selinger joined Amazon as a data mining expert in 2003 and today runs his own research firm. I felt somewhat intellectually intimidated by him, to be honest with you. He was just so smart and so driven and so confident in himself that sometimes it felt like I was getting squished out of the room. One of Selinger's proposals was to sell advertising on the Amazon homepage, but Bezos wasn't buying it. Yeah, so Jeff's initial wording, I believe, if I remember correctly, was that it was one of the stupidest ideas he'd ever heard. Uh, I think he was being subtle uh, in, in that. And so my team actually built a model that was able to predict how much profit we would generate from it and whether it would affect consumers negatively. So he takes a look at it and then he's perhaps more of a believer or at least willing to take a shot. What I really respect about Jeff in that moment, this is, this is probably the seminal moment in my career, to be totally frank with you. The seminal moment in your career? Absolutely. Why? Because you're sitting across from a billionaire and the billionaire tells you that he thinks your idea is stupid but he's still willing to do it. How often have we had a chance to do that any time in our lives? To turn and sway the tide of somebody smarter, more experienced, and certainly more powerful than we are. On an overcast Seattle afternoon, we spoke with two former Amazon executives. So this was about 2000s when we actually moved into this building. Okay. John Rossman and Randy Miller. Jeff Bezos a tough guy to work for? He has a low tolerance for thinking small, acting small, or not being extremely sharp. Or rationalizing. If you start giving rationalizations and excuses... Or pointing the other direction. direction ...he'll just he'll slash you to shreds. He's got a very effective, sarcastic bent to him. Both Rossman and Miller say Bezos not only invited confrontation, he demanded it. And woe to anyone who didn't measure up. Yeah, I've seen people sitting there, I remember one person said to me, oh my God, I was just praying that I was going to have a heart attack. So this would stop. <laughs> it's that bad. That bad. I mean, it was just one of those meetings where they had not been prepared. And I can remember at one point he said, I don't know if this is uh, sheer stupidity or gross incompetence. And, you know, kind of one of those. Or both, right? Or both, right. yeah. <laughs> if your math doesn't add up, if your logic isn't right, if you haven't thought it quite through, if he thinks of questions that you haven't considered, then he could be tough. In his book, Brad Stone describes a gifted student who grew up in Texas and Florida, raised by his mother and adoptive father. Stone also made an extraordinary discovery, locating someone Bezos hadn't seen in 45 years, his biological father, a man named Ted Jorgensen. I tracked him down to a bike shop outside of Phoenix, and I went and paid him a visit. To my surprise, he did not know what had happened to his son. And so it was pretty surreal uh, having to explain to this very nice, sweet gentleman that his son, that he hadn't seen in 45 years, was one of the wealthiest men in the world. Yes, Jeff Bezos turned out all right. I liked him personally. He seemed like a guy with a cheerful demeanor and a good, good sense of humor. In 1994, Shel Kappen was the very first person Jeff Bezos hired. Kappen wrote much of Amazon's early software. He left the company, a wealthy man, in 1999. He believes his former boss will only increase his footprint. He's very persistent. He's very stubborn. He likes to think big. He likes to think long term and is willing to bet everything on that. We decided to go big. <laughs> Today, Jeff Bezos has gone very big. He's worth some $30 billion, money he's used to fund a broad, even eccentric array of interests, from his own space exploration company to buying the Washington Post. And at age 50, the married father of four shows no signs of slowing down. You started this company with Jeff Bezos almost 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. When you think about its future, what do you think Amazon does from here? They're not going to stop until and unless some other force in the universe stops them. 
Global domination? Pretty much. Coming up, millions of packages, thousands of workers. Would you walk 15 miles a day in their shoes? It's really hard work, and people don't really understand how hard it is on you. The pickers, the packers, and the protests. Next. wondering how those Amazon packages get to you so quickly and who's behind it, you can start with a visit to a town like Campbellsville, Kentucky. Population 11,000. It's a place where you can find Amazon workers in the pews and at the pulpit. Amazon is a uh, great force here in the community. In an area desperate for good jobs, Pam Wethington's family is just one of many who have turned to Amazon. At one time, I had a daughter-in-law, two daughters, two brothers, and a sister that worked there. We all worked in the same plant. You want a hamburger? Like many in the post-recession economy, Dana Wethington says $12.50 an hour is a godsend. When I first started working at Amazon, I had six-month-old, I guess. He gave me insurance for him put food on the table for him. Amazon is a good job. And it's a job performed so seamlessly, customers give it little thought. But each time someone clicks to buy, a powerful apparatus is set in motion. The Amazon Fulfillment Center looks chaotic and it looks random, but it's actually highly orchestrated. Author and journalist Brad Stone has covered Amazon for 15 years. The conductor of the symphony is software in the cloud that's basically optimized the whole system to be as productive as possible. Across a space as vast as 20 football fields, workers manage the widest variety of inventory on the planet and move tens of millions of products at lightning speed. There is a promise of speed which is completely sacred. Nadia Shorabora is one of the architects of Amazon's fulfillment system, a monument to efficiency, which at its peak handles 426 orders a second. When you receive an email message from Amazon saying that the item is on the way and you will get it tomorrow, that promise has to be met at any cost. Virtually every decision, down to which size box to use, is determined by sophisticated algorithms. Every associate move, every move of every item, every box flowing, every tote arriving, all of it is run and coordinated by one computer brain, which runs that fulfillment center. But for all its cutting edge technology, Amazon fulfillment still falls on the backs of tens of thousands of workers performing manual labor. Dozens of former workers we spoke to describe an unforgiving pace and say too often speed and productivity mattered more than their well-being. I saw people last anywhere from a few days to maybe a month. Pickers like Stephen Abadili walk 15 miles or more each day to retrieve as many as 200 items an hour. A handheld device dictates every move and counts down tasks to the second. I would say I need to be in aisle 54 and get this item. And then suddenly, you're going to aisle 72, and you have 10 seconds. Abadili struggled to keep up, and like many, was eventually let go. I would get out of work, get home, and sit on the couch, and my body would just quit on me right then. You're a guy in your early 20s, Yeah. and you're still wiped out. I was <laughs> dead at the end of the day. The job also took its toll on Kay Johnson. A top performer who often packed more than 1,800 items a day. She left the company after seven years and won a workers' compensation claim against it. My knees, my back, my hands, they're never going to be the same anymore. All because of Amazon, you know. But others had a good experience. I love the job. Loved the job. I loved being with the people. I mean, Doc really Kane was a manager in Pennsylvania. 
He says the demands on workers are all in service to the customer. If things are slow in pick, it slows down pack, which slows down everything going out the door, which means you don't get your prime order on time. Warehouse work anywhere can be grueling. But a drumbeat of protests, lawsuits, and investigative reports in the U.S. and abroad have brought attention to labor issues here and raised questions about how hard Amazon pushes its employees. You heard the ambulance called all the time. People were passing out from the heat and, you know, having trouble breathing. Dana Wethington and other former employees describe a corporate taskmaster that demanded workers meet strict productivity goals no matter what. They want you to make 100% regardless, and with the heat, it's so much harder to make it. It's excruciating at times. In Kentucky and Pennsylvania, workers collapsed from heat exhaustion. After those incidents came to light, Amazon took steps to assure its fulfillment centers have air conditioning. But we also heard claims from workers of mandatory overtime, breaks that were hardly breaks, and an obsessive scrutiny of every move. I feel like Amazon was a prison. Andrea Burris has worked other factory jobs. She says Amazon was different. You had a set time you could go to the bathroom. If you wasn't out of the bathroom within that time period, then they were looking for you. You could not stop if you were getting sick. You could not stop to get a drink of water without them questioning where you're at. We asked Amazon about conditions in its fulfillment centers. Company officials wouldn't speak to us on camera, but in a statement pointed to Amazon's strong safety record compared to others in its industry. They did not address claims of unrealistic performance demands. The number of items they pick per hour, the number of steps they take, it's measured. And when they're not as productive as their colleagues, they're, they're put on alert. There's a line of other people in a lot of these communities waiting to take jobs. They're almost like robots, except they're obviously human beings. They're doing work that robots can't do. If they could, Amazon would probably eagerly replace their physical labor and their fulfillment centers with robots. The machine that Bezos has built is astonishing, delivering goods at a scale and speed never before seen in online commerce. Amazon has completely redefined convenience. But at what price? I used to buy items from Amazon before I worked there. I quit buying items from Amazon, and to this day, I have yet to buy anything because I know how hard and strenuous it is on your body to actually be able to get a package to you. Coming up, this paintball business partnered with Amazon. Amazon has a huge amount of traffic. That's very valuable. They have a huge brand. But then their partner became their rival. I just, I wish they didn't compete with me. Friendly fire when we return. Here you go, guys. Grab goggles, gentlemen, guns, air. Have fun. In paintball, you've got to stay on your toes and know your allies from your adversaries. You blew the purple. Stephen Herbert says it's the same doing business with Amazon. In terms of Amazon, do you sell to Amazon? He and his father, Steve, run two stores in New England called X-Fire Paintball. Let me grab this one out of your hand. They've been in business for 15 okay. years, but lately they've gotten a lot busier, thanks to Amazon. Amazon offers an awful lot. They offer a great marketplace. Their name is well known. So they have a lot of uh, advantages for us. In 2012, they started selling their products on the site, right alongside Amazon's own inventory, reaching an audience beyond their wildest dreams. If the two stores represented 100% of your sales 18 okay. months ago, before you started on Amazon, where is it now? We've got to be quadruple that. So your sales have gone up oh, enormously. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But also that sounds news, like good sure. news. But the Herberts aren't celebrating. That's because once they started selling on Amazon, they noticed a disturbing pattern. We might put out 100 products. Let's say 50 of them do well. Amazon sees that because they have access to our sales, and they will buy that product directly from the manufacturer and sell that, taking us out of the picture. 
the Herberts say Amazon was doing something a business partner shouldn't, poaching their sales. Some products are winners, some products are losers. Amazon watches and they see the sales data and they pick the winners. And then they go to my suppliers and try to buy it from the suppliers directly. So as soon as they say, I want that product, I lose all my sales and I'm stuck with this inventory that I can't sell. That sounds like a reason not to do business with Amazon. It certainly gives us a second thought. Today, more than 2 million independent sellers do business on Amazon, accounting for as much as 40% of everything Amazon sells. It's that network that helps make such a huge selection possible. In exchange, Amazon charges sellers a fee, commonly 15% off the top. For an additional amount, Amazon will even store their goods and handle the shipping. Author Brad Stone says many sellers find it all irresistible you get access to a fire hose of customers, you know, 200 million plus customers with credit cards stored who are ready to buy. It is a deal with the devil in some ways, isn't it? Well, I think you probably get more benefit selling on Amazon than you would doing a, a deal with the devil. Um, but it's funny because employees I talk to at Amazon describe it as kind of offering heroin uh, to these customers. Like it's, it's, a, it's an addictive hit. The sales are great and your business starts to depend on it. But over the long term, it can be destructive um, because, y y you know, Amazon guts your margins and, and often competes with you. In a statement, Amazon told us its own retail business does not have direct access to the data from other merchants selling on its site. But it says it will seek out its own supply of a product and sell it directly if there is customer demand. We wanted to know more, so we spoke with more than 100 independent businesses across the country who sell on Amazon. Many said the arrangement is only a plus, but some two dozen of them told us Amazon had undercut their sales by striking separate deals with their suppliers. Former Amazon executives John Rossman and Randy Miller are familiar with claims like that. From a startup, is it going to make it? Rossman, who left in 2005, was one of the chief designers of Amazon's third party business. We've talked to a number of the merchants who sell on Amazon. And in particular, they share the same sentiment, which is I have a best selling product, and suddenly I find, not long after that, Amazon has sourced the manufacturer. Mm -hmm and is selling against me. Right. And they don't understand why Amazon's doing that. Yeah, I mean, that's, that is the playbook. What do you mean when you say the playbook? I think um, the playbook of how to enter a business, learn the business, figure out where there's value and opportunity in the business, and then as they learn what works and what doesn't work, they start picking off the, the best part of those businesses. The rule of the playbook is either you're getting it or I'm getting it. And, and we would prefer to get it. Were they one of your biggest customers? Oh, absolutely, yes. Amazon was one oh, yeah. of your biggest oh, yeah. customers. Top five customers, absolutely, yes. Renee Arnold knows all about the hazards of doing business with Amazon. Not as a third party seller, but as a supplier. And it's better to have a sharp knife than a dull knife. Arnold is the North American CEO of Wusthof Trident, a German manufacturer of premium kitchen knives. Chefs worldwide love Wusthof's fine cutlery. In 2002, Wusthof decided to sell inventory to Amazon just as it would to any retailer. It's amazing. They were really just buying and we were shipping. I mean, that's all you want. They paid their bills on time, of course, had no problems with them. They were ordering, we were, we were selling. Arnold says the problem came when Amazon started selling Wusthof's knives below its minimum advertised price, a base level Wusthof sets to avoid cheapening the brand. Amazon was riding on our brand name and taking business away from our existing distribution. So in order to protect our general distribution, we just decided to pull out of Amazon. You will not go back to Amazon. You're done. Done with Amazon, yes. What's the price point on it? Wusthof may be done, but scores of other suppliers and more than two million merchants swear by Amazon when they're not swearing at it. Amazon has a huge amount of traffic. That's very valuable. They have a huge brand. They're a reliable brand. I don't mean to diminish that. You know, like I said before, I just, I wish they didn't compete with me. I don't understand why their 15% isn't enough to be enough for them. Some of those third party merchants say, oh, they're taking 15%, it's a great business for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why are they competing with me when they can just be doing that at no cost? I that's mean, it, because they can. Because that's their nature. That's their nature, right. Coming up, this battle is one for the books. 
Do you worry at all about retribution from Amazon for speaking out against them? Sure. Yeah, I do. The plot thickens when we return. Sunday in the park. Time for a stroll and a good book. We came mother to daughter. It's a maternal tradition. Give them to me. I want them all. But don't be fooled by the veneer of civility. Amid the paperbacks and pulp fiction, a war of words is being waged between the biggest names in publishing and Amazon, the book-selling behemoth that has turned the industry on its head. They control the marketplace. They're the big guy. They're the big kid on the block. You can't piss them off. They're a huge gorilla. For publishers Dennis Johnson and David Godin, book fairs like this one are a battleground. We have people who come here with their cell phones and they'll scan the barcode of the book and they'll compare the price I'm charging to what they could get it for at Amazon and they'll walk away. Amazon accounts for a third of both Godin and Johnson's sales. When you get together with other publishers, do you guys talk a lot about dealing with Amazon? Is that a subject? We do. At his Melville House imprint in Brooklyn, Johnson told us what happened when he crossed the online giant. We were asked to pay additional money, which would have put them getting a total discount beyond what we thought was not only workable for us, but legal. So we protested and refused to pay it. And what happened? Our books were pulled off of Amazon until we did pay it. And you continue to pay it, I guess, to this day? Yes, we haven't really disputed that since then. We can't afford not to have our books on Amazon. It's no longer just the talk of the industry. The battle has spilled onto the front pages. Well, I'll tell you what, Amazon. I have got a little package for you right here. Okay. When Amazon made it harder to buy books from the publisher Hachette, one of its authors, Stephen Colbert, let him have it. Wait a second. Here it is. So watch out, Bezos, because this means war. Amazon is bombing the cities. You know? They're attacking, and, and the publishers are just kind of sitting back there and being shelled and going, what can we do? James Patterson is among the best-selling writers of all time. I have an idea pile here somewhere. I don't know and one of Hachette's yet. biggest guns. I think books are important. Stephen King thinks books are important. J.K. Rowling thinks books are important, which is why all of those people are speaking up now and going, hey, uh, Amazon, please, this is not the toilet paper industry. This is, these are books. Are your sales going to be hurt as a result of sure. this dispute? Absolutely. Yeah. They are being hurt right now, of course. And there's a lot more to come? One would think that, that they're not just attacking Hachette. You've got to believe that Random House and Simon & Schuster and whatever are next. We need to think about this because they are so powerful. Amazon told us that like all retailers, it has a right to choose what inventory it stocks and on what terms. It also said it's working hard to come to a resolution with Hachette and that when it negotiates with suppliers, it does so on behalf of customers to keep service and value high. It's just the latest controversy for a company whose growth has been dramatic. Amazon now controls more than a third of the book industry. Amazon was determined to gain market share from the beginning with loss leader pricing. James Marcus, who joined Amazon in the early days, said it's always been willing to forego profits to win customers. Right in the beginning when I was there, they kind of controversially began discounting New York Times bestsellers at 50%. Now, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that at that price, Amazon was losing money on every single one of those books. Losing money, but gaining power. After gutting brick-and-mortar retailers, publishers say Amazon can now strong-arm them for deeper discounts. You got two of the best in that series. Well, they're a very thuggish company. They don't take no for an answer. It's their way or the highway. And that's why people are afraid of them. Retail is a contact sports. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, I think uh, there, were, there were a lot of concerns in publishing. Obviously, as we got bigger, other sellers got smaller. And Former Amazon executive Randy Miller left the company in 2006. He acknowledges that Amazon bullied publishers and makes no apologies. Well, the power went to Amazon, didn't yes, it? Yes, to a certain it did. Extent. Yes, it did. And, and Amazon always seems to press its advantage. Yeah, well, you, that's the handbook. It's rule number two, I think. Press your advantage. And he did. 
When publishers balked at giving Amazon ever deeper discounts, Miller buried their titles on the website, ensuring their sales and ranking would plummet. It was called pay to play. Obviously, legal after a while said, mm, that name is not very good. Let's call it vendor realignment. Another Amazon program invoked the law of the jungle. Miller says it was called but, Cheetah. Uh, yeah, Jeff's story was, Cheetahs never go after the strongest person in the herd. They look for the weakest one in the herd, and that's who they go for. So if you're really going to take vendor realignment to its next level, target the weakest first, because they're going to probably fold more quickly. Although it doesn't seem a particularly great way to term things. No, 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 no. But Honest. you can visualize it. You can right. visualize it, right? You can see it, right. without a doubt. I know it's Wild Kingdom in your head, right? You can see the cheetah running around after the poor publisher. But what's bad for publishers can be good for readers. A huge assortment at your fingertips. Got the Kindle store, millions of books to choose from, by far the largest ebook store in the world. As the book wars rage on, Amazon's supremacy has propelled the company into the business of devices. First, the Kindle e-reader, then the Kindle Fire tablet, and now the Amazon phone. I think you'll be unsurprised to learn that we lavished attention on this phone for reading. Today, Amazon customers feast on not just e-books, but movies, music, and games. Born a bookseller, Amazon is now competing with tech giants like Apple and Google to create and distribute a world of content. All part of the infinite marketplace Bezos imagined years ago. He never thought, I'm going to just have the greatest bookstore on, on earth. It was cunningly chosen as a point of entry. He always envisioned this sort of planetary commercial empire, and that is what he has. Coming up, sales growing by the billions. So where are the profits? In fact, it is probably one of the least profitable retailers in the world. Waiting for Amazon's payoff when we return. If you want a window into Jeff Bezos' outsized ambitions, just follow the small yellow box. When Amazon revealed the idea of delivery by drones, it was widely considered a PR stunt. But it was also something more. A spectacular reminder that Bezos is always looking towards the future. Whether Amazon continues to soar or not may depend less on unmanned aircraft than unmet expectations. Over two decades, despite hundreds of billions in sales, the company has barely turned a profit. They are the teacher's pet of Wall Street. They get a free pass that nobody else gets. Sucharita Mulpulru is an analyst with Forrester Research and an Amazon skeptic. How much money are they really losing to win and to beat retail competitors like Walmart and Target? So how much money are they losing to win. It is my estimate that for all of the retail products that they ship from their distribution centers, it probably costs them five or six billion dollars more to deliver that product to shoppers than what they bring in in revenue. And that, Mulpulru says, can only be sustained if Amazon shareholders remain patient, happy to wait for the fountain of profits they believe will one day pour forth. I think that Wall Street loves the unknown because the unknown provides hope and where there is hope there is a case to be made that the answer is a really really big payoff at the end of the rainbow many founders ask for that kind of faith from investors but few actually get it jeff bezos once again has proved to be different you have to have a long-term orientation you have to be willing to think long term the stakes are enormous both for Amazon and its customers the stock is up 15,000 percent since the company went public but its profits are not if that starts to worry investors Bezos may feel pressure to boost the bottom line by raising prices and as he said for years that could spell trouble are our customers loyal to us Absolutely, right up until the second that somebody else offers them a better service. 
And I really believe that. I think our customers will behave that way. And so there is no rest for the weary. Bezos has an army of believers. Bill Miller is a renowned investor whose funds profited from big and early bets on Amazon. The market is clearly rewarding Amazon's operating strategy. And I believe it's rationally rewarding it. And I think that's what the skeptics are missing, that there's a, there's a good fundamental reason for it. So as long as people keep looking at Amazon by looking at earnings, they're going to get it wrong. The undisputed king of online shopping has made its vast enterprise look easy. Amazon now offers same-day delivery in several major cities. Think that's fast? Nadia Shora Bora says, just wait. I think the true vision is one hour. One hour. One hour. That's not possible. <laughs> uh, we are going to have. What are you going to do? Drop it from a shoot somewhere? I mean, what, we're going on. to have the same interview and the same conversation in five years, and uh, we're going to see what happens. Whether that happens by drone or some other mind boggling means, the point is clear. Bezos refuses to think small. You need to be able to invent. That means you need time, because invention implies trial and error, it implies failure, it implies experiments. Firefly recognizes a hundred million different items. Amazon's new phone is further proof that Bezos is unafraid to challenge anyone. After upending publishing and retail, Amazon has begun its assault on the $600 billion supermarket industry. Its most promising venture may be Amazon Web Services, a cloud computing platform used by huge customers, from Netflix to the CIA. We have a culture here which is about pioneering, about inventing new things. We like to focus on the customer. We wake up in the morning in the shower thinking, how are we going to get customers to say, wow. Now, I happen to believe that this is a great business strategy. Amazon is looking to the future with plans for a massive new headquarters in Seattle. Its billionaire founder seems as voracious as ever, disrupting industries, antagonizing the status quo, selling everything to everyone, while his company, admired and feared, extends its reach by the day. I'm David Faber.